we'll get started. Glad you can all be here this beautiful fall morning. I saw a fellow this morning on the way driving in. I thought, that guy must live in Death Valley where it's always at least 110. He had on a, a jacket, he had on a hat that looked like a winter hat, he had on a ski mask. <laughs> and he's walking, I'm thinking, what, either you're going to commit a crime somewhere, or <laughs> really cold weather. Maybe he's from Texas, I don't know, do you? <laughs> Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful. We're thankful that we can be here. We're thankful for the beautiful weather you provide. We're thankful that you want us to be with you. We're just humbled that you who are all powerful want we flawed humans to be in your presence and you made that possible. Thank you for your word. Guide us in our study. We sing we pray in Christ. Amen. Before we commence our study of the book of Hebrews, I'd like us to look at uh, a few scriptures, a couple at least, um, to help with context, as I believe it gives us insight into what the church struggled with in the first century, the cultural, uh, the religious dilemmas of that time, and possibly helps us see a little bit of of God's thinking, of God's approach to this, how, what what he saw and what he, of course, he didn't have to struggle. I mean, he gets an answer like that. But how he solves this problem that in our mind would be almost insurmountable. Let's begin in Matthew with a text this um, text is repeated. It's in uh, Mark and Luke, not in John. Um, and it's in Matthew 9. And we see here that uh, Jesus has been eating with the tax collectors in 9-9. Uh, and ten, and the sinners. And he says, I didn't come because everybody's righteous, and in fact, if you're righteous, you probably don't need it. I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, but he said, it's not the healthy people who need a doctor. I want us to look at 14 through 17. Leonard, do you have that? Matthew 9. Yes, sir. Okay. Which one? Uh, 14 through 17. And I'm wondering if uh, somebody could run the projector since this thing doesn't <coughs> seem to be working. I'm sorry. Next slide. Here we go. Are you go ahead. Go ahead, please. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do you why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Okay. What's being exposed here that provides a teaching moment for Christ? What, what, what is being exposed? I mean, logical question. The Pharisees fasted. John, the Baptist's followers, fasted. Why don't you fast? Or the issue of 
what fat, who fasting is for and what fasting is about. Yeah. Well, it's also a contrast. He's, he's setting up because this next verse is critical. The, this next parable is critical. He, he's setting up a contrast here between the rigid rules of the Jewish system versus what is really important. The liberty that is in Christ, the grace that's going to be under the new law. Um, and so we've got the old law written in stone. I mean, that's a, that's a hard thing versus grace. Is there anything wrong with what the followers of John and the Pharisees were doing? No. No. They were keeping the rituals that were prescribed by the Mosaical law. And the traditions of the scribes. Now, was Jesus then breaking the Old Testament law by not requiring his followers to conform to these traditions? Well, of course, we know Jesus kept the law perfectly. So, no, they were fasting because of some rules that had been added as extensions, because of all the traditions that had been added. There was nothing wrong with fasting, but they were requiring this fasting as a show of piety. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, as part of... Pardon? A show of show. Yep. Uh, a, a show of righteousness, a show of religiousness, a show... I mean, why do we do some of the things we do? Why do we... have classes and have an assembly. I mean, is that set in stone? Is that something that, well, you know, here's the chapter. No, no. It's what we do. And we would feel uncomfortable if we didn't do those things. And if, again, if they'd been part of God's laws, Jesus would have kept them. And he would have had his followers keep them because he kept the law perfect. Now, the teaching moment. Go ahead and read, uh, Leonard, if you would, 16 and 17. But no one puts a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine in the old wineskin. Otherwise, the wineskin bursts, and the wine pours out, and Wine skins are ruined, but they put new wine into fresh wine skins, and both are preserved. Okay. Doug, I appreciate you. What is the lesson that Jesus wants to convey with this parable? Yeah, there's something new coming, and you can't, you can't wrap it up with the old container because it's going to burst the seams. And he says, it, "This new covenant that I came to put into place, it's not just an add-on to the Mosaic law. It's not." the law plus. It's a whole new covenant, a whole new testament. What's a testament? It's a will, right? A will and, you hear the words often, will and testament, the last will and testament. Well, it's a new testament between God and mankind as a whole. Anybody know what a codicil is? C-O-D-I-C-I-L. Ever hear that term? Well, a codicil, back when wills were handwritten, of course, it's not used very much now because we've got computers and you just spit out a, a new will if you want a new will. But back in the old times, when everything was written by hand, a codicil, C-O-D-I-C-I-L, was a legal document that act, acted as 
a supplement or an addendum that corrected parts of the original will. And you could make changes to your will that way without having to rewrite the whole thing. Maybe a paragraph here and a paragraph there would be in the codicil, and you'd refer, refer to the codicil instead of these paragraphs. Jesus is saying, this is not going to be a codicil. This is not going to be an addendum. He's moving his followers toward looking at worship of and service to God as not looking back toward Moses, but looking ahead to the Messiah, looking ahead to this new system that he is going to put into place, not a patched up system, not retrofitting the old system into a cobbled together mosaical Christ agreement, but a completely new testament, a new system. Yet now, would it continue some of the old laws and commandments? Yes. So, Master, which is the most important commandment? And he says, what are they? You know? Well, you can sum up the law and the prophets in these two. So, it's not like, okay, that, that, that's not, we're, we're not even going to pay any attention. Yes, we are going to pay attention, but there's going to be a new testament, a new will, a new agreement. God never changes. So some of the ideas are still in the new. But there's a new covenant between God and all humans. But it's not, it's not saying now that, uh, that the Old Testament is, is uh, all going to change. You know, which one of the Ten Commandments would you do away with? Right. But right. Those, those things are covered. You can hang the rest of them. In those two. That's right. You can. And I think... Um, it seems to me this is why Hebrews was written, to expand on this theme that Jesus is trying to make here and clarify for the Jewish believers that they needed to understand that Christianity isn't just the Old Testament plus. It's not just Moses' laws and my teachings but a completely new, a completely separate, we're going to break that, the temple curtain is going to be torn. The temple is no longer going to be built by men's hands. It's going to be separate. It's going to be have some of the characteristics of the old into it. Basically, a lot of the, the ten, except for the keeping the Sabbath and all that. Which is, you know, it's seems pretty why did they struggle so much to us but you, you have to look and this was a huge deal because they had how many how many years of history building oh, okay. up to this and now all of a sudden well you're keeping this you're not keeping this why not because you know it gets it gets very complicated i mean you got to give this, these people a little bit of grace because this would have been hard to fully understand thus the need for hebrews to tell explain why one is so much superior than the other. It, it would not have been an easy thing to, to, to mentally get past or emotionally or anything else. There's a weak uh, parallel, I think, that I happen to think of. Um, anybody here believe that we should stand when the Pledge of Allegiance is being said or cover our heart when the Star Spangled Banner is being sung? What if that was part of our religion? Not just our tradition, our patriotism. What if that was part of our religion? And all of a sudden, somebody comes along and says, well, the flag doesn't really matter. You know, we're, we're going to look to a different flag, and you can't even see it. We're going to pledge allegiance to a different country, and you can't even see it. I mean... Without it being as far as, uh, I mean, it just patriotism, which just, but still and all, without it being part of our religion, now it would be hard for us even if it weren't part of our religion. And this is their whole life. Their whole life is built around this 
religion and these traditions and these practices. Before we move on from this idea, let's look at another scripture in Matthew. Matthew 13, I'm going to have Donnie read some here. Uh, in Matthew 13, we've got a number of parables. Um, it starts out with the parable of the sower that we're going to hear some more about this morning when Denny uh, presents his lesson, if I understand the post correctly on Facebook. Um, it then talks about the parable of the tares, and it talks about the parable of uh, mustard seed, baking, it talks about a treasure, it talks about fine pearls, the parable of the pearl of great price, and then he wraps up this series of teaching with the parable of a great net full of fish. And you're going to pull them all in, and then they're going to be sorted. And then Jesus asks his followers in Matthew 13, verse 51. Why don't you read 51, Donnie? Have you understood all the things? And they said to him, yes. We get it. Yep, we get it. Next verse, please. And Jesus said to them, Therefore every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out, out of his treasure things new and old. Okay. Who, who, who's the scribe? What did the scribes do? They copied, but they had another. We, we often hear about the scribes and the Pharisees. They were considered experts. They were experts in the law. Another, sometimes it's translated where that word for scribe is translated lawyer, or um, they were teachers. They were, the, they were the big teaching gurus. A lot of the rabbis were scribes. And. So he's saying here, from now on, if you're going, he says, they've been taught about the kingdom of heaven. These are the converts. These are the ones who are now following Jesus. And they'll teach you about the old law, but they're going to teach the new things as well. They're going to bring treasures. New and old. New and old, yes. They taught the followers of Christ. And the Pharisees. And the Pharisees. That's correct. You see that? And I had, I, I stumbled across this in my study. I'm sure it was a spirit guided thing because I've read through these parables many times and always missed 52. Um, you no, know, it's interesting. He says the new and the old, like that. Is, until, until full clarity of the Old Testament prophecies and everything, until those were connected through clarity through the Spirit, they didn't get it. They, they got pieces and parts, but they didn't get it. Now, you're starting to tie all this, these foreshadowing and prophetic things into Christ and then the, the, the end story as well. So it, it really does the new and the old together start meshing into this grander this grander picture that God's had from, from before time. Right. Yeah. All right. The instructor in the kingdom of heaven, basically Christ is saying that I'm establishing, will be using some of the Old Testament, but will also be embracing the new truths that I am revealing from God. Okay. This book is somewhat unique among the New Testament books in that it does not, in its text, reveal the author, nor the specific congregational group or audience to which it's addressed, and it contains 
nothing in it that tells us as to the general time of its writing. We have to assume, though, because it uses temple tabernacle language so much that if the temple had already been destroyed, it would mention that. So, again, an assumption, but it's not in the, it's not in the text that it was written before the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and so, obviously, having these deficits, there, there's been a lot of uh, discussion and arguments about these topics over time. According to notes I've read, I would offer some thoughts on these matters. And bear in mind, this is not scriptural. This is from men's ideas and, I, and uh, ancient scholars. <coughs> Um, the fellows that are talked about here um, were scholars in like 130 A.D. to 150, 160 A.D., okay? So they weren't too far removed from the establishment on the day of Pentecost of the church. It appears that early manuscripts of this book did not even include a title the title Hebrews. Early church writers, including, and here we go with these names, Clement of Alexandria. Now, if you, if you recall, Alexandria was a great center of learning. Started by Alexander the Great. Uh, it was called, I think, Constantinople at one point. Uh, but Alexandria was also a learning center for the church. And Clement of Alexandria supposedly was a believer. Um, as well as Jerome, you may have heard of him. He was an early uh, Christian writer. Euthalius, Christostom, Theodoret, and Theophylact. Writers, again, 130, 160 AD. They mentioned that this book had an inscription that was appended to it early on. And according to Barnes' notes, this is, inscription is found not only in the Old Greek manuscripts, but also in other earlier versions, and was to, quote, doubtless affixed at a very early period, end of quote, by writer or writers who were expressing the contemporary thought of their time. The inscription, again, not placed there by the author of the letter, but the inscription is and these 30 writers all mention this, the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Hebrews. But to which group of Hebrews <laughs> or Jewish believers it was addressed is less certain. Possibly it was written, and a lot of these early writers think that it was written to the Jewish converts in Palestine or Judea or Jerusalem and its surrounds, so Palestine. And a number of sources believe that's the case. If the letter was written by Paul, if, if, we would note that it does begin differently than all his other letters and concludes differently. What, what are the differences? What, what do we know? How does Paul write? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul, a prisoner, I think is how Philemon started. Philemon. Uh, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ Jesus, and so on. Definite, definite writer. I'm, I'm the one. This is from me. And also, what is another unique thing about most of his letters? Exactly, and that's usually on the end of the letter. Not always, but usually is. Um, he mentions that meet in this so and so who meets in the house of, or this person who has assisted me, or that person who has done things for the faith, that sort of thing. None of that in this book or this letter. So facts support, facts that support that the letter was probably written to the Jews in Palestine. 
Well, the content, if we look at it, deals uniquely with subjects about which the readers are presumed to have intimate and minute knowledge. And that would be of Hebrew history, of the old law, of the customs, of the practices, of the rituals, of the sacrifices. I mean, really, really unique uh, situation. Next. Yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. There's no mention of pagan rituals. There's that mentioned a lot in a lot of the other uh, books. Or temptations such as Jews would experience living out in the Gentile world away from Palestine. And Jews removed from Jerusalem and its surrounds would not have as great a familiarity with the temple and its workings as those who regularly attended its worst services of worship. I mean, imagine this, okay? Someone attends here once a year, and they normally attend somewhere else. How much would they know about our interactions and about how we do things and why we do things and maybe even specific individuals in the congregation? Not very much, probably unless they were related biologically to someone here. Um, and so it's easy for us, or at least me, I'll speak for myself, to forget the differences in the congregations of a Jewish congregation in Palestine and a congregation, say, in Corinth or Ephesus or Thessalonica or Crete. Because in Palestine, it's made up of devout followers of the law of Moses who had converted to Christianity. But they still observe the tenets of the, of the Jewish law versus congregations made up of maybe Jews and Gentiles or mostly Gentiles um, who not, did not know the Mosaic law and didn't care. You know, it, it's easy for us to think in our world, okay, we've got all these different congregations, especially in our nation, all these different congregations. But in that world, you were either a pagan idol worshiper, didn't worship anybody, or you were a Christian. But then comes the big division. You were a Jewish believer, or you were a non-Jewish believer. You were a Jew who had converted and still held on to Jewish customs or you were a Jew that had converted and you were kind of separated so it was easier for you to kind of drop some of those things. Which, which is interesting, that concept. That was, they would have to fight that concept because there is no differential between the two but exactly. humans get to play in yeah. and, and put, put labels on Remember how Paul, let's go over to Acts 21, I think it is. I don't have this on a slide. But remember Paul has gone uh, three uh, missionary trips. He's now come back to Jerusalem. He's been told you're going to be bound up. He's had this prophecy. And in 2117, Mark, you want to read um, 17 through 26, please? When we arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us warmly. The next day, Paul went with us to visit James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they praised God. Then they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands of believers there are among the Jews, and they are all zealous for the law. Ah! Ah! Okay. Now here's the next verse. They have been told about you 
that you teach all the Jews living among the Gentiles for, uh, to forsake Moses. There you go. There you have it. And that you tell them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. What should we do? What then is to be done? Yes. Hang on just a second here. So here's the dilemma. Again, my very weak illustration about patriotism, the flag, the, the, that the founding fathers were men who recognized at least that God had a hand in this whole thing. And that's part of our religion and it's who we are. We're Americans through and through and we can trace our lineage back to Father George and all this stuff. These people, how's it worded there? They want to obey. They hold on to this law of Moses. And they've heard that you're teaching not to do that anymore. Ooh. And, and Paul even muddies the water a little bit more. Not, not no downside to what he's doing, but he still observes some Jewish yes. customs. Yes. So go ahead, Mark, and read down through 26. Or, yeah. Okay, the question again is, what then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Uh -huh. So do what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Join these men, go through the rite of purification with them, and pay for the shaving of their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you but that you yourself observe and guard the law. But as for the Gentiles who have become believers, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. Then Paul took the men and the next day, having purified himself, he entered the temple with making public at the completion of the days of purification when the sacrifice would be made for each of them. So here we have um, mention of Paul paying for haircuts. Okay. I want to read something to you. I normally don't do this. But this was so well written and had such, uh, was so appropriate to what we're talking about here. Then I'm going to read it. Uh, I'll skip over some of it, so if I start stammering around, you'll understand I'm looking to where I should jump. The majority of the earliest believers in Christ were Jews. Although the Jewish people as a whole did not accept the claims of Jesus, the earliest Christian documents do bear witness to a significant Jewish response to gospel preaching. Luke reported that 3,000 people responded to Peter's Pentecost sermon, Acts 2.41, and that about 5,000 believed in a slightly later time, Acts 4.4. When the Apostle Paul went up to Jerusalem around AD 58, the leaders of the Jerusalem <coughs> church informed him of, quote, how many thousands of Jews had believed, Acts 21.20. Since the population of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus was only around 40,000 people, these figures testified to the growth and historical existence of Jewish Christianity. The existence of Jewish churches finds explicit testimony in diverse sources. Acts 8.1, Galatians 1.22, 1 Thessalonians 2.14, and archaeological excavations have revealed synagogues with Christian symbolism at Nazareth and Capernaum. These church communities endured a series of persecutions in the midst of a tumultuous era in Jewish history. Early leaders were arrested, Acts 4, 1 through 3, 12, 3. People were ostracized from synagogues because of their faith in Christ, Luke 6.22, John 9.22, John or Luke, uh, no, John 16, 2, and some suffered physically and endured the seizure of their property, Hebrews 10, 32 through 34. 
Of course, one of the leading instigators of persecution appears to have been Saul of Tarsus, Acts 9:11, Philippians 3:6. In AD 62, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, James the brother of Jesus, was publicly executed by the reigning high priest, Annas. That's from Josephus. Um, and it's also in Eusebius, the ecclesiastical history. Despite such external pressures, the Jewish churches continued to expand, expand and witness. At the outbreak of the first Jewish revolt against Rome, the Jewish Christian community refused to participate in the conflict. This refusal reflected a profound change in the Jewish Christian understanding of its pur purpose and mission. According to Eusebius, an early church historian, the church of Jerusalem was warned through an oracle to flee the city and seek refuge across the Jordan in a city named Pella. And then they returned subsequently. In theology and practice, Jewish Christianity possessed certain characteristics that set it apart from the emerging Gentile, emerging Gentile Christianity. Jewish Christianity may have had distinctive Christological emphases, such as referring to Jesus prominently as the prophet like Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 18. It produced a significant body of apocryphal literature. Unfortunately, most of this of what is known only in fragmentary form. Most significant is the Judeo-Christian veneration of the law of Moses. For Jewish Christians, faith in Christ was consistent with adherence to traditional practices such as circumcision, Sabbath keeping, and dietary restrictions, Acts 15, 1. Church leaders in Jerusalem described Jewish believers as zealous for the law. We just read that. For these reasons, Paul's preaching that Christ, not the law, was the center of all things, Colossians 2, 2 through 3, was often regarded with suspicion and even hostility. And we read about that hostility here in Acts 20. Uh, one. And Paul had to defend this message throughout his writings. We see this in Romans uh, chapter 3, verse 31. As late as the second century AD, the Christian apologist Justin Martyr still distinguished Christians of Jewish origin who demanded that Gentiles observe traditional commandments from those who were ready to accept those Gentiles who did not. It was a big deal. It was a very big deal. And that is why I believe that Hebrews was written to these Palestinian Jews because they would be the most staunch supporters of this we got to hold on to what we got kind of thing in addition to embracing Christ because they didn't see any conflict. And there wasn't, aside from a few things. Did, did you happen to see on the, on the authorship part? I mean, you, like I said, most of the letters we have from Paul are written to either a mixed or a high high population of Gentile people, and that was his <coughs> ministry for the most part was to them. But would he have had a different writing style had he been writing to Jew, did Jewish writing style of Format of letters and stuff was it different than a Greek or Roman uh, of the day? Well, there's some thought the reason that Paul didn't put his name at the front the way he did with all these other letters, if he wanted to have any impact and have them read at least part of it, he didn't want them to say, "Oh, Paul, forget that. You know who he is. You know what he's done. You know what he's teaching. I'm, I'm not even going to waste my time." Um, don't. Well, every one of his letters, if you look, if you when you start looking, there's little nuances to the way he writes things, and little little things that actually have a pretty profound impact in the way it works. Yes. And that would, I mean, that type of logic would would hold. I mean, if he knew it was going to have an impact one way through through being in spirit, he would do it differently. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the ways that he presents the material in this letter, um, I think, are very similar to ways that he presents material in 
other letters. Let me rephrase that. A lot of the ways that the material is presented parallels how Paul has presented material in other letters. So, um, so Hebrews is primarily written to Jews and primarily written to demonstrate the superiority of the new law, the new system, the new testament through Christ over the old system delivered through Moses, the superiority of a system instituted by God in flesh versus the system revealed by men to men. And hence this is why the letter begins as it does. Next slide, please. In the past, God spoke through the prophets to our ancestors many times and in many different ways. But now in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son. God has chosen his son to own all things and through him he made the world. The son reflects the glory of God and shows exactly what God is like. Did Moses do that? No. He holds everything together with his powerful word. When the Son made people clean from their sins, he sat down at the right side of God, the Great One in heaven. So if we look at this, we see a parallel in Ephesians chapter 1. You want to read 8 through 10, please? Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 8 through 10. Um, he, the Son reflects the glory of God, shows exactly what God is like. He holds everything together with His powerful Word. Um, 8 through 10. Let me start it. Okay, start it. Which He lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. In all wisdom and insight, which He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind, his kind intention which he proposed in him with a view to his administration suitable to the fullness of time, that is, the summoning of all things to Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. To the end, to the end that we were the first to hope in Christ, we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message, truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who has given us a pledge of our inheritance with the view of the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Okay, so the, the, the thing is, in the vision about how everything is possible. Okay, God's secret, Christ. His secret weapon against Satan Christ risen from the dead. Yeah, that version doesn't use it, but another version uses uh, about purification, which is going to instantly take these people back to this, this purification in the Old Testament. So right. Start tying things together for them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One more thing here. Um, don't put this next slide up yet. When you think about letters or books in the New Testament, that quote the Old Testament. And you think about, okay, which, which book or books have the most Old Testament quotes in them? What would you say might be number one? If you were just going to say. Yeah. Maybe you might say Hebrews. That's what I thought. Matthew or Acts. But I don't know. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, this is, I didn't, the I is not me. This is a thing that I copied out of a, a, a source. So this person went through and all the uh, Old Testament quotes in the New Testament. So Romans is number one, Matthew is number two, and Hebrews is number three. And then from there on, it's, you know, it goes way down. But I would have said Hebrews, because I think about Hebrews, I think about the old law and about the temple and about how he's describing the service of the priests and the service of our high priests and all that. 
back, back. Yeah, back and forth, back and forth. Nope, nope. Romans. And Matthew. And Matthew would not have come to mind at all. Not at all. But there it is. Okay. Um, so, we'll wind up there and um, we'll read the letter uh, probably just the first four chapters, uh, first three or four chapters next time. I want you to, if you get a chance, uh, read through at least those chapters and see if you can pick out some themes of each chapter. Uh, of course, we've got this overall theme of the book, Christ and his system is superior. So if you get a chance, read through. Thank you.